Thank you so much for joining us on traditionally what is called Boxing Day. Um, and yeah, so yesterday we had Christmas and I trust you were blessed and if you weren't, the very fact that you got air in your lungs, that's a blessing. But you, I want to talk to you today about, um, about Christmas and do we really need Christmas? Before I get into the message, for those of you who don't know, I'm Paul yeah, from Life Connect, and we're so glad that you've connected with us online. So the question is, do we really need Christmas? Now, I, I listened to a teaching by Anne Stanley quite a couple of years ago, Who Needs Christmas, and it sort of inspired the message, and I looked at his notes and you know, added some of my things. And so this is where we are at. Do we really need Christmas? Now, the 25th of December yesterday, we celebrated the birth of the Messiah. And whether it's the, the right date is irrelevant in my eyes. It probably isn't, well, the right date. But that doesn't matter because it doesn't change the fact that Jesus was born. There's enough historical and physical evidence and literary evidence of the existence of Jesus. And then there's also the conviction in the hearts of millions and millions and millions of people. But Christmas didn't begin with Mary, with Joseph and Mary. In fact, Christmas began with a couple who were unable to have children. Christmas began thousands of years before the birth of Jesus. Christmas began with a couple that were given this news that seemed unbelievable and in fact impossible. So join me in Genesis 12 verse 1 to 3. The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now this is a pretty big statement that God is making to this man telling him Abram he wasn't Abraham yet, he was still called Abram. He said, I want you to leave everything familiar to you. I want you to leave your security, um, your, your extended family. And guess what? There's no GPS. There's no GPS coordinates. There's not even a map. You just walk and I'll tell you when you're there. Now, I don't know about you, but if I look at this, and if I had to be in Abram's shoes, I would have been a little bit uh, like, I would be panicking, I would be like all over the place and I would probably run away. But he leans into this, this promise and he obeys God. And the promises are, I'm going to make you a great nation. But in his mind he must be thinking, but I'm not even a father. We're old, we're unable to have kids, otherwise we would have had already. How's this going to happen? says, I will bless you. And he's thinking to himself, but how's God going to bless me? Because I'm leaving behind everything that is familiar to me. That doesn't seem like much of a blessing. I will make your name great. And I must be thinking, but I'm a nobody. I'm like, you know, no one outside of my family, my area knows me. How's this going to happen? And he says, you will be a blessing. And Abram's thinking, Lord, we fight for our very survival every day. How are you going to make me a blessing to other people? And the impossible part, I think, was this. And all people will be blessed through you. Everybody, everybody, <coughs> excuse me, is going to be blessed through you. If I was in his shoes, I would have like, what? Are you serious, Lord? How does that happen? But the fact is, it does happen. And they go on. This most unlikely couple go on to have a son called Isaac. 
and Isaac would have a son called Jacob, and Jacob would have 12 sons, Joseph being one of them. And these 12 would become the fathers of the nation. A more unlikely dysfunctional family could not have been chosen. People who sold their brother into slavery, who lied to their mom and dad, who, who like, I mean, they were the worst of the worst. And this is the family God chooses to make a nation. If you fast forward, they did become a nation. But when we pick up the story, they are a nation of slaves in bondage to Egypt. What type of nation is that? How are they going to be a blessing? How are they going to be this mighty nation? They're supposed to be there to bless others and they're fighting for, for survival on a daily basis. They flee Egypt with the help of God. They enter the promised land. But there's violence, there's wars, there's bloodshed. And we're thinking, wow, when they're supposed to be a blessing, they're supposed to be a blessing to everyone. But there's war and loss of life and all of these things. But you see, we can see it as a blessing because we look at it from this side of Christmas where they were living in the moment. Now another thousand years plus minus passes and this nation now has a king. They've got King Saul, then King David, then King Solomon and under David there was still very little blessing because you know he was still, he was warlike and he was conquering those enemies who came against him and he was claiming land and doing all these things but under his son Solomon he builds up this nation and they begin to be a blessing but then Solomon man he causes the downfall of the entire nation because he takes all these wives and they've got different religions and he adopts their religions and brings this into <coughs> into Israel who is supposed to be God's people and he causes a downfall and because of his bad planning and the way he does things the nation actually splits into two. And we've got the nation of Israel and Judah. <coughs> Folks, I'm so sorry. I really got something in my throat. Now Israel, the northern kingdom, gets invaded by Assyria. And Assyria carries off all their possessions but all the people as well, and disperses this chosen nation amongst all the nations of the earth. And Judah is fighting for its own survival. They're fighting each other, and they um, are turning from God, but the biggest threat is from Babylon. And Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, eventually invades them, conquers them, carries off all the holy relics and some of the people. But God is not done with this nation. At this moment, there isn't a nation. They are dispersed all over the world. They're taken captive once again. But God sends prophets to them time and time again. Prophets to warn them about the way they're doing things, prophets to warn them to turn back to God, prophets with a message, and one of these prophets was Isaiah, and in Isaiah 49 verse 6, part B of that, God slips this into the prophecy, but it must have been like someone took an amplifier and shouted this out for them, because when this hit their ears, they would have been like, is that even possible? And it says, I will make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. And we are the Gentiles. And in this declaration, God is saying, through this nation, I'm going to reach all people, and all people is you, and it's me, and they thinking, what? How is this even possible? 
God sends after Judah is conquered and carried off into Babylon. He sends another prophet. But he sends his prophet to, to, to the nation with this message in Malachi 1 verse 11. And God makes this de declaration. My name will be great among the nations. From where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great amongst the nations, says the Lord Almighty. And these poor Israelites are thinking, my name will be made great. Lord, do you know that the people are, are, are laughing at us? Do you know that we are starving? starving? Do you know we are, we are far from home? Do you know we are, we are on nothing in the eyes of the world? And you say, through us, your name will be made great. That seems like impossible. In fact, God, it seems like you can't even stop Alexander. Alexander the Great, who is conquering everything and everyone and is introducing Greek, the Greek language and Greek philosophy and is just taking over and we can see Alexander being great. But it's difficult for us to see God being great. And years pass and Rome, who's the 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 center city of the Roman Empire. They are the dominant force, these Romans. And they control most of the countries and if not all of the countries around the Mediterranean Sea. There's one little obstinate group of people and they are this resilient nation who continue to resist. So Rome appoints General Pompey, one of the greatest generals, and gives him this huge army to squash this tiny little nation. And Pompey invades Israel and he destroys absolutely everything in his path and he takes the holy city of Jerusalem. And it's said in the history books that he rides up the steps of the temple on his horse. And this in the minds of the, of the staunch Jewish believers would have been an absolute sacrilege. It says he walks into the Holy of Holies and he rips open the curtain and there's nothing inside. And Pompey must have been astounded because a God has to be something of substance, something you can see. Uh, there, there is nothing. There is no image. There's, there's nothing. He must have been wondering, what is going on here? But God is still at work. Even if Pompey can't see God, God is still busy working. So Rome occupies Israel and they build this system of roads all over the world, connecting cities. They build ships that can cross oceans. They make this mighty nation. They bring in people of different backgrounds, different, different languages, different abilities, and different religions, all into one grouping, and they are seen as this mighty nation, Rome. Now that is not... What God had said is it. Amongst or amidst this despair, the Israel Israelites must have been thinking, what of God's word? What happened to the words he spoke to the father of our nation, Abraham? Was God lying? Is God even real? And this is what makes Christmas so remarkable, is that when things seemed hopeless, when the possibility of God's word coming to seem the most unlikely, things begin to happen. The problem is that the things that were happening 
were not what the people were expecting. In fact, this group of people called Israelites didn't recognize the signs of the time. It took three men outside of their religion from faraway lands, so-called wise men, to recognize that something significant is going or busy happening. The second group of people who realized this truth were second degree citizens of the nation. They were lowly shepherds, walk, looked down on by everyone else. But they got the truth, these lowly shepherds, because God's perfect plan was busy becoming a reality in the land of Israel, in a tiny town called Bethlehem, like the prophets had told thousands of years before. God's plan, his perfect plan, was being unfolded before the very eyes. Paul the Apostle Paul, in the book of Galatians, he explains it like this, and I'm reading from the Message Bible because it just puts it in, in everyday language and I love the way it puts this. From chapter 4, verse 4, Galatians, when nobody was expecting it, all the cogs of God's wheel fell into place. The wheel set in motion when? In Genesis. God never stopped loving his people. His plan for his people was always that a saviour would come and that they would be great and that through them all nations will be blessed. Through them salvation would come to the Gentiles, to you and I. Now I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. And it starts off with a genealogy, a list of all the ancestors of Jesus. And often we don't bother to even read that, like sort of skip over it because this one was the son of that. Or if you're reading the King James, this one begat that one and this one begat that one. And it's like, oh, what they're talking about. And so we tend to skip over it, but there's so much value in that genealogy. If you go and you count, there were 30 nine generations from the time God made his promise to Abraham until that baby in the manger. The experts vary on this, but anything from 1,700 to 2,166 years past where God's plan was busy being played out. You see, God was in control. If you go look at that ge genealogy, Matthew 1 verse 16, it says, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah, the chosen one, the saviour of the world. Now Mary wasn't even at that stage Joseph's wife. Because Mary fell pregnant. She wasn't married to him. She was betrothed, like sort of engaged. But they took it a little bit more um, ser seriously than what we do. Uh, so she was betrothed to him. And Joseph, according to society and, and, and the norm of the time, should have turned his back on her. He should have walked away. He should have let her and her family be disguised. But because Joseph was part of God's plan all along, even though it was 39 generations later, Joseph did right by Mary and ignored the norm of society and he married Mary because Mary was part of God's plan. You see, Mary was just one of the cogs in the wheel of God's plan. But it went beyond Mary. It was about her son and his name. His name, ladies and gents, is Jesus. The answer to God's plan for his people. And today Jesus is known throughout the world. You know, some people try to ignore him. Others are trying to, to disprove him or they're trying to talk him away. Uh, some people actually turn from him and, and make as if he doesn't exist. 
but there are books written about him. There are movies made about him. People, millions of people love him and, and, and follow him and worship him because they know he is the truth. He is God's plan. Now, I don't know about you, but yesterday, when we celebrated Christmas, people all over the world, people in their millions, if not billions, got together to celebrate the promise of God, a promise called Jesus Christ. Even people who are not believers, are not followers, who have their own gods, recognize this day as a special day. And they hear about the story of Jesus if they want to or not. Because the truth of God will always filter through the lies of the world. So what was God's plan? What was it that Jesus was supposed to do? Well, Jesus was the reset button. It was to restore things to factory settings, to the way it should have been, to the way God ordained it before we, man, chose to sin. Jesus was giving us an opportunity, a choice. You see, every single one of us was on our way to hell. And God created through Jesus an alternative that you get to choose. That was God's plan, to give you and I a choice to be with him or to be without him. And Jesus is the choice. We get to choose him or to look the other way. That is why Christmas is important. Look at the world, folks. Look at the world. Look at the condition of the world. Look what is happening in the world. And then you ask me, do we need Christmas? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Because in Jesus we have hope. In Jesus we have a future. And in Jesus, because of this time, because of Christmas, because of his birth, we have salvation. And because of Jesus, salvation can come to every nation. But first, it's got to come to you. How did you see Jesus yesterday? As a baby in the manger or as your personal saviour? I want to pray for you that you saw him as your personal saviour and that you have received him as such because Jesus was God's plan for you and for me and for millions of brothers and sisters all across the world. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you and we just thank you, Father, for your grace towards us, for continuing, Lord, across generations with a promise you made to Abraham. Thank you that today we can be the result of that promise and we can be, Lord, a blessing to other people because you sent your son, Jesus. And now, Lord, we receive the gift of your son. We acknowledge him as saviour and we say we are going to put aside our worldly ambitions. We're going to put aside our worldly vices and we're going to follow the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, because today we've realized how desperately we need Christmas. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for delivering on the promises you made to each one of us. We thank you for who you are and we thank you for who we are about to become in Christ Jesus. We are no longer orphans. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen. Just you have a beautiful day with your family. You enjoy the rest of the holidays and the festivities. Um, just, you know, keep Jesus center of all things. Let, that, let him be your guide. 
And I'm really excited to walk into this new year with you. Join us again on the 2nd of January as we kick off the year with a series that is likely going to be called Habits. And don't we all have them? We love you from our house to your house. Be blessed. We love you. Thank you for joining us with us. And thank you again for sowing into this ministry of ours so that we can change the world with your help, one heart at a time. Love you. Be blessed.